Asthma is a lung disease that affects approximately 7 million children in America. It is the most common chronic disease in children and the most common reason children miss school. Asthma causes your airways to become inflamed, making it hard to breathe. There is no cure for asthma, but it can be managed with proper prevention and treatment. Some common symptoms of asthma can include coughing, wheezing, chest tightness, and shortness of breath. The best way to prevent an asthma episode or attack is to follow your treatment plan. Learn your triggers and avoid them. Take your allergy and asthma medicines when you should. Use your quick acting medicine as soon as you start to notice symptoms. For more information on asthma awareness and prevention efforts that you can put in place at your school district, contact the Office of School Safety and Security by either phone or email, or visit our page at the Department of Education website. Good afternoon. My name is Steve Lynch with Oklahoma State Department of Education, Office of Safety and Security. Our topic today is asthma. During my 34 years as a teacher, I dealt with two athletes that had severe asthma attacks. One died and one survived. So at this time, I'd like to define the word asthma. It is a lung disease that affects approximately 7 million children in America. It is the most common chronic disease in children and the most common reason children miss school. Asthma causes your airways to become inflamed, making it hard to breathe. There is no cure for asthma, but it can be managed with proper prevention and treatment. Some common symptoms of asthma can include coughing, wheezing, chest tightness, shortness of breath, so the best way to prevent an asthma episode or attack is to follow your treatment plan. Learn your triggers and avoid them. Take your allergy and asthma medicines when you should. Use your quick acting medicine as soon as you start to notice symptoms. Today, I'd like to introduce our special guest, Dr. Greg Blair, who also lost a nephew with a severe asthma attack after football practice one day. Good afternoon, Dr. Blair. Thanks for being with us. Sure. My name, as you said, is Greg Blair. I am uh, originally from Bartlesville, Oklahoma. Grew up, went to high school there, and then went to medical school at the University of Oklahoma. Uh, I am an internal medicine doctor by trade. Uh, I've been practicing for about 25 years. The last half of that time, I've been what they call a hospitalist, uh, where I do most of my work in the hospital setting. I now work in downtown Oklahoma City uh, most of the time and uh, take care of lots of uh, asthma patients, but lots of just general medical problems as well. Uh, became attached uh, to this program uh, after my nephew uh, died of an asthma attack uh, after school, uh, after he'd been at football practice uh, a little over 10 years ago. Uh, obviously that was a, a tragic event. The family since then has developed the Brendan McClarty Memorial Foundation to remember Brendan and his uh, struggles. And uh, we've been working with uh, different asthma initiatives since that time. What is asthma? Uh, you know, asthma is one of the obstructive airway diseases. Uh, and by obstruction, they're talking about uh, making it difficult to get air out of the lungs uh, because there is obstruction. So asthma comes with a lot of inflammation, bronchoconstriction, the airways actually close off a little bit, and lots of secretions. And so you can have lots of different symptoms from asthma, but based on that, that physiology I described, when the airways narrow off, that's where people get a lot of wheezing sounds. Wheezing is actually whistling within the lungs. Uh, and anyone who's experienced an asthma attack will, will tell you that it really isn't a problem getting air in, but it's a problem getting air out. And so the first thing you notice a lot of times is, is someone wheezing or making that whistling sound uh, as they exhale. Uh, a lot of times you'll hear someone who doesn't even realize they're doing it. You might be sitting in a quiet place and you'll hear someone making a little bit of a wheeze. And it's that bronchoconstriction, the constriction of the airways that happens with exhalation. With um, a significant asthma attack, 
the body's inflammatory cascade kicks off. So the body just basically gets overactive in its inflammatory system, starts making extra uh, secretions. The airways actually swell. And so that restriction in the airflow, the obstruction of the airflow uh, becomes more prominent. And so because of those secretions and that closing off the airway, a lot of times the symptoms of wheezing, uh, the symptoms of asthma can be uh, more cough or sound like someone has bronchitis uh, where they're coughing and bringing up lots of uh, phlegm and, and nasty stuff uh, from their lungs. And really that's a symptom of asthma as much as it is of any kind of infection. Do you need to be diagnosed with asthma to use an inhaler? No, uh, you know, the, uh, there's lots of different reasons we would use a and there's lots of different kinds of inhalers. So for this purpose, I'm going to assume that we're talking about the albuterol inhalers. Albuterol is a medicine that dilates airways. So anything that causes someone to be short of breath, if you can use an inhaler and dilate that airway open a little bit, you may be able to help symptoms. So lots of times uh, inhalers can be used for people with bronchitis, uh, or minor infections in the upper airways to help open those airways and help you be able to cough things out. They're used a lot in pneumonias. Most recently with the pandemic, we've just been going through for almost three years now, inhalers have been used uh, repeatedly and they're the prime medicine that really has affected people uh, that's been able to help uh, people with COVID. So the inhalers, primarily developed to help people with asthma and other obstructive airway diseases. Uh, I think a lot of people have heard of COPD, uh, which can be chronic bronchitis or emphysema. All of those different things can use inhalers to help. For our purposes, there's no reason that a child or you know, a person at school needs to have an actual diagnosis of asthma to use these inhalers because the inhalers can help lots of different problems and lots of different symptoms that are associated with constriction of the airways. Uh, you know, the most key point for us is that people in that age group, people under the age of 18, really people under the age of 25, by far the most common cause of recurrent shortness of breath, wheezing, uh, you know, respiratory distress without any other obvious issue going on, by far the most common cause is asthma. And so, uh, you know, for our purposes, the, the feeling is that treating anyone who has significant shortness of breath as if they have asthma uh, is probably the right diagnosis and the right medicine even if it's not necessarily the right diagnosis, it's almost certainly the right medicine to at least get them some help and bridge the gap until emergency personnel and other medical personnel can uh, arrive on scene. What is a spacer and is there an additional cost? So a spacer is simply exactly what the word says. It is a device to provide some space between the inhaler and the patient's mouth. Uh, so the, the real purpose is that when you, if you've sprayed an inhaler before, you see a cloud of medicine come out. And actually, if you look at it from the side, that cloud of medicine is probably going to go a couple of feet. Well, if you have that inhaler in your mouth and it's trying to squirt a couple of feet, it's actually trying to squirt medicine past the person's throat. And uh, it's you know, so a lot of that medicine, a lot of that cloud of vapor actually hits the side of the mouth and the back of the throat and gets uh, absorbed in the mucous membranes. And so it doesn't really get down into the lungs where it's more functional. So the purpose of a spacer is to provide a small chamber where we spray the medicine into the medicine and some of the pressures inside that chamber help to hold that vapor within the chamber. And then when the patient breathes uh, the vapor, more of that gets into the actual airflow and goes down into the lungs. What I've got here is a 
sample of the spacers that we give out with the program, I'm trying to get it to come into focus here. Uh, this is one of our disposable paper uh, cardboard spacers. A lot of people have seen the cylindrical plastic spacers that now sometimes are given out by your doctor's office or in emergency rooms, uh, especially to children. Those plastic reusable spacers are nice to have and great for an individual. They cost about $25 a piece. So to use those recurrently or to have to have one for every different person uh, who may be using an inhaler gets cost prohibitive pretty quickly. We're able to supply these cardboard uh, spacers that we say are disposable and, and they, tip, they, they are disposable. We just throw them away when, um, when they're used up. But we do ask people to hold on to these spacers if you have someone who's using the inhaler repeatedly. If it's the same person, that same person can reuse this cardboard inhaler uh, multiple, multiple times. The reason that's important is even this cardboard disposable inhaler costs about $5-ish. So, you know, if they're using an inhaler once a week, the cost can uh, go up pretty quickly. To use this cardboard inhaler, it's not showing up great in our video, but there's just some squeeze points on the side. And you can see it's just a little piece of flat, flat cardboard. When I squeeze it, it's going to open up and it roughly forms the shape of a tube. And so when we put the inhaler in one end and squirt medicine, like that, the medicine goes into the chamber. The cloud of medicine can actually be seen through the window there. And then the patient puts their mouth on the end with two little holes uh, and, and breathes the medicine in. You don't disconnect the inhaler while you're doing that. The other interesting thing is for young kids who maybe not be able to time an inhalation to, you know, we've all seen pictures and seeing commercials where they show someone doing an inhaler and they squeeze and try to bring the medicine in, you know, time it to where you get a good dose of medicine with these spacers, with the medicine basically suspended in this uh, chamber, especially young children can just put the spacer in their mouth and keep breathing on it. And we ask them to do that for 20 or 30 seconds. When, when you've dealt with a few significant asthma attacks or more serious asthma attacks, it's really difficult, especially for a young person, to take that long, slow, deep breath to bring medicine down deep in their lungs. So by holding this on here, having medicine suspended within the spacer and letting someone huff and puff basically on the spacer, that medicine will work its way down into the lungs. Do inhalers have an expiration date? Yeah, I, I'm pretty sure it's a federal law that all prescription medicines have an expiration date, but inhalers definitely do. Uh, I think from the time they're manufactured until they go bad is somewhere around two years. But the, the important thing is that every inhaler comes in a box and the box will have the expiration date printed on it and the inhaler itself will have the expiration date printed on it. Uh, and so, yes, the medicine does expire. The way this program is set up, we need the schools to help us keep track of those expiration dates. Uh, we deal in uh, many, many inhalers uh, across the state, and we're working on a database and should have a database to help keep track of those, but we need the schools to help report to us what those uh, expiration dates are and let us know beforehand if something's about to expire so we can help replace those. Uh, so our process more, more recently has changed to become more automated. So now we have supply requests available online. So the schools are able to fill out uh, a request for a new inhaler online. And this could be used either your inhaler is about to run out or has run out or it's about to expire or is already expired. Expired. Uh, and if you'll put that request uh, online, we do ask that you give us a month's leeway so we can get it to you easily. Also, when you're low on spacers, uh, let us know as well. Uh, and, and just back to that, I, I, I mentioned and we usually mention during the training, it is okay to reuse these cardboard spacers as long as it's 
you know, on the same individual. Don't use them for multiple people, but the same person can use the same spacer. Um, if we throw away those spacers every time we use them, it actually is just, just another cost that adds to the whole cost of the program. And unfortunately, anything medical becomes expensive pretty quickly. So we just try to be safe there. Where should inhalers be stored? So inhalers don't have to have any real special treatment. They don't need to be in a refrigerator. The big deal is they also don't need to be in your car. Uh, now that's part of the program to begin with. The inhaler is a medicine. It needs to be kept in uh, someone's office, preferably locked up. I believe it's not a requirement that it be locked up. Okay. Uh, but it needs to be kept under control of the people who are trained for the program so that, uh, you know, someone can't just find the medicine and, and take it. It is a prescription. It's a very safe prescription, but uh, we have to treat all prescriptions seriously. I mean, it is still a medical thing. Um, so they can be kept at room temperature. They can be kept in a drawer. Just if you leave them in your car and they get superheated, uh, it'll ruin the medicine. Um, if they get wet, you know, <laughs> dropped in water or something like that, it can ruin the inhaler. So uh, just kind of some basic usual uh, care for things. The other thing is with these disposable spacers, I was reminded, we can also store those in a plastic Ziploc bag in between uses uh, for, you know, the kids to be able to reuse that same spacer. But it's important to remember not to zip lock, not to uh, seal the top of that bag because that will retain moisture and, and uh, lead to the spacer falling apart. Write right. the student's name on that bag so they, they can reuse that same space. Do you have to be trained to administer the inhaler? And that's part of our whole program. Anybody that's going to administer the inhaler needs to be trained uh, through our program. Uh, that's a key, and that's part of the law that was passed to make that uh, to make these available for everyone. Also, someone's uh, parents, I mean, they may be able to dispense it, but they can't dispense our inhaler. If they were to bring them to the school and have their own inhaler, you know, we don't need to try to stop them from doing something. They probably know better than we do. But uh, as far as our inhalers that are stored at the school, they have to be done by people who are trained, who have documented training at the school uh, and, and who have gone through the, the program. What is an appropriate dosage? So uh, there's a couple of different answers to that, but I'll give you the, the correct one. Uh, you know, the, the dosage most people hear about when using one of these inhalers is two puffs every six hours as needed. In our situation, the as needed portion has already happened and that's why the student has come to the office. They're short of breath, something's going on. It's pretty clear that we likely need to use our inhaler or at least assess them to see if we wanna use the inhaler. So our protocol for respiratory distress calls for four puffs. And that sometimes confuses people because they've all, you know, a lot of people who know about asthma have all basically been told forever use two puffs at a time. Well, when you go through our training, we explain that each puff should take 30 seconds to a minute to administer. Because again, we are going to use a spacer. We're going to ask them to breathe as slowly as possible and get as much of that medicine in as possible. And even if they're just gonna take a deep breath and hold it and get that medicine down in, we want that process to take at least 30 seconds, if not a minute, to get as much medicine down in their working as possible. So the program says four puffs. This medicine, and, and someone with asthma can tell you, works very fast, within seconds. So if they get a good dose of medicine in, and it is bronchodilating and helping, the student will know very quickly. Within a minute, at the most, they'll know that it's working. So by the time we're done with that second puff, a couple of minutes should be up and we can kind of assess, is this person breathing a lot better? A lot of times the students know they have asthma, they know what the symptoms feel like and they can tell us, I feel, I'm feeling better. 
So if they're improving significantly after two pups, there's no reason to continue. We don't have to give them four pups. So um, if, if they're feeling better, we don't have to do that. If they're not feeling better, we wanna go ahead and give them all four pups and see what happens then. Now, you ask what's the right dose? If someone is still in respiratory distress after four puffs and it's been five minutes or so, we're all, all going to be nervous. We're all going to be scared. And at that point, I'm going to assume that paramedics have been called, that 911 has been notified. If they haven't, we absolutely need to notify 911. So if someone is still having respiratory distress after the first rounds of therapy, we absolutely need to be notifying 911. And we can then repeat the process and give four more pups over the next five minutes or so. When should I call the parents or guardian of a student that may be in respiratory distress? And, and that's almost a trick question. So at what point should we call the parents or the guardian? My answer to that is if the student comes to the office and needs to use our inhaler, their parents need to be, or guardian, need to be notified. Um, there are students who have significant enough symptoms or frequent enough symptoms that their parents may not be that distressed by the call. They may just say, yeah, this happens every day, uh, but we still need to call them every day and let them know that they are coming down and having to use our medicine in the office. This does two things. Number one, it notifies families that there's something going on and maybe they're a uh, child isn't well controlled, but uh, number two, it also gives uh, documentation for the parents to know, hey, maybe I need to take my child to, the, to, to our doctor or nurse practitioner or healthcare professional and get reassessed because clearly they're not making it all the way through the day on their current asthma regimen. Uh, we should always notify parents um, if they're having to use our inhaler uh, and, and never take any of that for granted. When should I call an ambulance? So the way I teach the program or talk about it when we do these presentations is whenever you feel scared. So if a student shows up in the office and you're nervous and think something's wrong, call 911. I think the, the point to that is we know that most of the people controlling the inhalers and helping to uh, use the inhalers are not technically medical personnel. So we don't want you to feel like you have to make medical decisions. If something looks wrong, if this student scares you, uh, if they're more short of breath than you feel like is normal for this person, call 911. There's, there's, there is no reason not to call 911 if you think something is significantly wrong. So technically we tell people if they're very short of breath, so if they can't speak in full sentences, if their lips are turning blue, if you notice fingers are turning blue, uh, certainly if they're passed out, you know, if they have to be carried to the office, all of those are signs that absolutely 911 should be the first phone call. But I like to emphasize to people, don't be afraid to call 911 if you think uh, a student is not responding to the inhaler or is getting worse. Or, and that's why I just say, if something about the situation just scares you, call 911. I've spoken to many paramedics in the past. And the last thing any of us want to do is have to uh, put a breathing tube down or do chest compressions or you know, true life-saving things on a child. Uh, in fact, if you ever call 911, the ambulance people are going to get very nervous and, you know, this is not the fun part of their job going to a school for respiratory distress. So if they show up at the school and by the time they get there, things have improved a ton with the medicine, which is what normally happens, they will be thrilled. You know, the ambulance people are not going to be upset that you called them. Uh, there is nothing that they deem more important than taking care of children. So if you call them and the child gets better by the time they get there, they're going to give you a high five and tell you that is fantastic. Uh, no one's going to be upset if you call 911 too often. So if you're scared, call 911. Um, 
that's kind of my my whole spiel on that. I want to make sure that nobody feels like they need to play doctor or play nurse uh, if they're not one. Uh, if you are uncomfortable, call for help. That's why help is there. How long is the training to qualify people to administer an inhaler? So we have a course uh, that takes about an hour to complete the whole course. Uh, we're not training people to be medical professionals. We're not training people to be experts in asthma. What we're training people is to recognize someone who looks like they're significantly uh, in respiratory distress, recognize some of the symptoms of asthma, and get a very basic overview on how to use an inhaler and how to use a spacer. The real purpose of the training is so that people are more familiar with symptoms and the, the medicine and the spacers so that if they do have to deal with it in a uh, critical situation or in a, a stressful situation, they at least have the familiarity to be able to, you know, take care of things without suddenly going, oh no, I have questions, what do I do now? We want to get those questions answered before they might have to use the skills. So the, the training is not a real detailed, uh, difficult training. It's basically a familiarity with the medicines and with the, the tools that we're using. Uh, and it can be done in, within about an hour. Do students need to have a prescription in order to receive treatment? This is a, such a great question. That is a, a common misconception that students need to bring their own medicine or have a prescription or have a diagnosis of asthma. Uh, and that's part of the purpose of creating Brendan's law that was signed into effect a couple of years ago. The law helps to indemnify people who are taking care of students with respiratory distress. It's very similar to the law that was passed a few years ago uh, regarding EpiPens. Uh, if if uh, anybody is familiar with that law, if you have to use an EpiPen, you're not going to get in trouble for it. And that's the same with this albuterol inhalers. Uh, the law has been passed such that anyone with respiratory distress at a school event can utilize the inhalers that we're supplying uh, as long as trained personnel are, are controlling the inhalers and helping to use it those trained personnel are then protected against uh, getting into any trouble. Uh, and also the students, if they're in respiratory distress, we don't want them sitting around waiting for someone to get them to a doctor and diagnose asthma. We wanna treat it and then figure it out later. So the law was also designed such that you don't have to diagnose asthma. They don't necessarily have to know that they have asthma. Uh, they don't even necessarily have to have asthma. If they're short of breath, we can use the inhalers to try to help them while we're getting more help. How should I record the use of the inhaler? So that's more uh, details that are covered during our training um, of, of where we need to record everything. And currently, and Steve, you might have to help me, but I believe it's through the Brendan McClarty, uh, let's see, it's Brendan McClarty, foundation.org website yes. that uh, there are forms to fill out and we need those things documented every single time you use the inhaler. This helps to keep this program compliant with the law uh, so that we can continue supplying inhalers and we really need that documentation. So we need documentation of when you use it. It, it once you've done that a time or two, it honestly should be able to be done within a minute. It, there's just a couple of questions to answer uh, and we're documenting what's been done. We don't want the student's name. We're not trying to get any personal medical information from them, but we are trying to document how often these inhalers are being used, uh, hopefully to show over time that we're making a huge difference. One of the ultimate goals of a program like this would be that it can actually go nationwide at some point if we show that we're benefiting students uh, and, and saving lives, this is something that, you know, maybe the federal government needs to take on and, and put it in every school in the country. But right now, uh, obviously, we're just dealing with, with Oklahoma, but we need to collect that data to stay compliant with the law and to keep this thing going long term. Any last thoughts? 
Yeah, I, I think the one big thing that I like to to comment about this whole program is this was created by the foundation, the Brendan McClarty Memorial Foundation, to try to prevent anyone else from going through what our family has been through. So, you know, our goal initially was to prevent anyone, you know, children from dying at school of an asthma attack. In Oklahoma, the odds of that happening aren't real high. Uh, I mean, I, let me rephrase that. The, the odds of someone dying of an asthma attack at school are, that's very rare. Uh, this program certainly can save someone like that because the faster you get medicine into them, the faster their asthma attack is gonna recover. So the key to preventing a very, very serious asthma attack is A, avoiding triggers that cause asthma, but B, getting medicine into that person as quickly as possible. But I always like to point out that we've seen a lot of other side effects or uh, secondary benefits from this program that we did not recognize were gonna happen. And the biggest one is the decrease in the number of days missed from school. So studies tell us, or we've learned this uh, since starting this, that if a student goes home from school for an asthma attack, on average, they're gonna miss two more days in a row before they come back to school. So a kid coming down during their second or third hour right before lunch needs to use the inhaler, is not feeling good, they call their parents, and that kid goes home, they're not gonna come back to school for two or three more days. Kids that are that bad tend to have symptoms throughout the bad period of asthma, which unfortunately is pretty much fall through spring. So the whole school year, these kids are suffering with uh, potential asthma symptoms. And if they're missing two to three days of school every month, these are students who a lot of times fall behind. Now we don't have data to show that we're making that kind of a difference as far as keeping kids in school more often and helping them uh, to perform better but it's, it's intuitive that if someone's not missing two or three days of school every month because of asthma, that they're probably going to do better in school, be able to participate more in school, be able to participate in activities in school, and just feel better overall. So, and, and we've heard those stories time and again from school nurses who are using the inhalers saying this poor person used to have to go home, you know, once every couple of weeks. Now they're in school all the time. Now they're happier. They don't feel sick all the time. So we're seeing those extra benefits, uh, not just of saving lives, but we're, I feel like we're changing lives. And, and this, this keeping albuterol in schools like this truly can change a lot of kids' lives. Remember, as you said uh, earlier, Steve, the incidence of asthma is huge. 10% of school-age kids have asthma in some form or another. And that percentage is probably actually higher in Oklahoma than in the United States in general. So that means in every classroom where there's 25 kids, at least two of those kids have asthma and are at risk to have problems like this. So it's, it's so common. It's such a, a big uh, problem and it's so undertreated nationally that we really are seeing results that are just amazing right now. I'd like to thank Dr. Greg Blair again for all this great information today for our asthma program. And as uh, shortly, uh, you will see a QR, QR code uh, that will pop up on this presentation and our website. We have built out a Canvas uh, program on our website and you can take this course. So thanks again for having us today and being a part of our asthma program. Mm -hmm.